All right, I'm Pete Hammond here for BAFTA today, talking to BAFTA, and welcome. And uh, this movie is a special one, and, and there's a lot to talk about here. And I'm so happy to have with us, first of all, the film's writer and director, John Lee Hancock. Hi, John. Hi, Pete. How are you? I'm good. One of your movies sitting right behind you there, Al the Alamo, yes. <laughs> I think it's the Italian poster. The Italian, very cool, very cool. Um, and then, uh, of course, one of the Oscar winning stars, you've got three Oscar winners here in the three lead roles, and uh, he plays Albert Sparma, what a great name. Uh, this is Jared Leto. Hi, Jared. Hey, hey, Pete. Hey, well, welcome. And, uh, you know, there's so much to talk about with this movie. And it's one of those movies that you talk about afterwards and you go, you put all the pieces of the puzzle together if you can. It's different in this genre, but boy, what a story bringing it to the screen, John. I mean, 30 years, something like that. When you wrote it, the world technically was a different place even. Um, I, I, I talked to a lot of people. Jared talked, you know, when we did, uh, talked about Dallas Buyers Club. That was 20 years. Uh, this is 10 years longer to bring to the screen. Yeah, yeah. I wrote it in 92, 93. I came across a script where I had registered with the Writers Guild in 90, spring of 93. So I was uh, living in Hollywood at the time in a crappy apartment and was into crime stuff and um, was had a blind picture deal with Steven Spielberg, a perfect world um, that Clint Eastwood directed had come out in 92, I believe. Um, so I wrote an outline, about a 20 page outline for this story. I concocted it and uh, sent it to Steven and he was cutting Schindler's List, I believe. And he said, boy, this is a dark, I don't think I can go to this dark place. <laughs> two movies in a row and I understood that um but yeah it's um you know it started out as a, a contemporary piece and now ended up a period piece <laughs> and so in in bringing the script back I mean that's a long journey as it goes in and out and different people and you had a whole directing career in the meantime <laughs> yeah. uh not intending you know this to be one probably that you were going to direct when you wrote it no, no. I mean, it was it was going to be Stephen, and then for a, a moment, it was Clint Eastwood that I'd worked with, who, who I'd worked with before. Um, then I spent well over a year, kind of meeting with Warren Beatty um, about potentially directing it. Danny DeVito, when he was directing, was uh, attached, and it almost got made back then. I can't remember what year it was. And then I started directing in earnest in 2000 with The Rookie, and Mark Johnson, who had always been the producer on it would every couple of years say, what about the little things? What about the little things? But I had little children at home and thought, I don't want to live in that dark place for two years. Um, and so I just kept pushing it down the road. And then a couple of friends of mine, it was interesting, a couple of friends of mine um, who are really talented writer directors, Scott Frank um, is one of them and um, Brian Helgeland is the other. And they they kind of each on their own reached out to me and said, what about the little things? Cause they all both love the script so much. And so I thought, well, maybe I should look, look at it again. And I did. And, and I liked it. I was afraid that I was going to go back and read and, and see, you know, what, what a, what a terrible novice writer I was back then, but uh, I liked it. And um, so the next, the next phase was to try to try to get it made. And it was set up at Warner brothers and, you know, and thankfully they said yes to a very interesting and uh, complicated uh, and hopefully fulfilling adult drama. Yeah, you know, it is the kind of movie you would think uh, studios would have made maybe at the time you were writing it and that sort of thing. It, that, that world has changed now too. It's a very different world of getting movies made. Something like this might be more independently made right. now. And, um, but it's cool, I think, that it's coming from Warner Brothers. You know, and, and this movie, I, I this is the kind of studio movie I'd love to see. Me too. Yeah. Me. Now talk about the cast, because 30 years in the making, did you have any dream you're going to have, by the time you get this made, one, two, three Oscar winning actors that all said yes. <laughs> um, I And this is going to sound strange, but I'm so, so happy it took almost 30 years to get made. Because with this cast, it's it's perfect, and it just kind of congealed in my brain and in, in the best possible way. Um, so I'm the luckiest guy in the world. But yes, I mean, to have 
three great, great actors say yes to something you've written is makes you feel really, really good. And then you, you wake up with a cold sweat and go, oh my gosh, now I've got to make sure that it's as good as I hope it can be and to help them help me. Yeah, did they have input? I mean, when you're working with people like Denzel and Jared and, and Rami, I mean, in their characters and things to help you hone the script after all these years? Absolutely, and then you, you'd be foolish not to uh, embrace them with open arms in terms of all their thoughts because they have not only a lot of talent, but a lot of experience. And they also know themselves and what they do and what they're looking to do. I think. And so we, yes, um, with all three actors, worked with all three actors to kind of refine and define the script. And it was, it was, a, it was a real pleasure. It was a, you know, it was a masterclass for me. Let's ask one of them right now, Jared. So what was it other than the name, which is such a great character name <laughs> that made you like jump in and say, yeah, I want to do this now. Well, it was a lot, uh, there was a lot there that was hard to say no to. Um, but I think at first I was a little nervous about taking on the role. And in fact, I, I said to John, what are we going to do about this name? It's just too, too crazy. And then I fell in love with it uh, <laughs> quite a bit. Uh, I think it's, it's kind of a classic. <laughs> we want to name Albert Sparma. Where did you come up with that, John? I, ha I have no idea, but I described you in the script as call you Brian, which means snake-like. And I don't yeah. know why I chose that, but yeah. Yeah, then the name came. And then when you said that up front, you said, I'm, what are we gonna do about the name? I thought he's probably right, maybe it's too much. And so I actually, for a moment, changed it to Albert Parma, which just sounded yeah. <laughs> And then, then the yeah. next time we met, you go, no, forget I said that, I love it. Yeah, 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 I mean, it, it, uh, it, it's one of the, is it uh, onomatopoeia? Is that the, the word? It's like his name actually- Activates. Sounds like he, like he would, like he is. His name sounds like him. So there's something really cool about that. Yeah. And I think it was actually in hindsight, like a nice way into like one of the, uh, one of the clues into the character because it's such a, it's such a jarring kind of obtuse name. And he's, he's, he's got that, that to me, a subtly jarring obtuse nature about him. Well, also, um, but I, and also it's one of those things where I remember thinking about the name and thinking that the, the burden a name like that places on an individual who grows up with that name and how does that affect Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely, just one more thing to kind of maybe set them set them up to be you know picked on or bullied by other people or to feel uh not a part of the group right and uh it's almost a name from another time from like a hundred years ago or something mm -hmm. um but you know sparm is an old-fashioned guy <laughs> you know? but you know it, to answer your question pete you know i i met with john lee hancock about a I think a year before maybe he started, you know, kind of casting his movie or, or shooting it. And I, I was a huge and am a huge fan of the founder. Uh, and like I said before, I think it's just a perfect movie and it's just so beautifully directed uh, and acted. And it's just a phenomenal, um, you know, just a classic American film. I think it's, it's a genius movie. Uh, and I wanted to work with John. I was a little nervous about kind of playing like the villain because I feel like I've done that so much, but it was just, I couldn't say no to John. And I thought, well, maybe this is a way just to kind of, you know, dive in deep to something that really, to a place I hadn't been before. So we kind of dug into the transformational parts of the character and the character building. And that was, was actually a blast. I had a lot of fun it was a bit dark and I think like John you're probably right not to do that with the kids and stuff because I remember at a certain point I was like do I can I just stop reading these transcripts of like FBI interrogations and mm -hmm. you know things that you don't need to see on the dark web type deal uh but you know between John and the rest of the team it was just like impossible to say no so I'm a lucky dude I like the way you said the villain, because that's the way you look at him 
throughout the movie, y- you have us guessing what's going on. I mean, the cat and mouse games that Albert plays with uh, Denzel's character and Rami's character are kind of fascinating and not always, you know, oh, oh, he's got to be the guy, you know, and we're just going to wait until the last act when finally it all happens. But this never is that easy. Yeah, and, and, and exactly what you said, Pete, is one of the reasons I wanted to write it this way. Um, it was because I think when I was writing this in the early 90s, there were a lot of cops and killer movies that were, you know, where the first two acts were full of clues and misdirection, and it was interesting. And then you get to the third act, and your, 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 your cop would figure out who the bad guy was, and then they would be racing around shooting at each other. And I always felt like that was inferior to the first two thirds of the movie. And so trying to come up with something that felt of a genre and yet really wasn't at the end and unravels in a really complicated and I think, you know, interesting way. So that was, it was an answer to a lot of other movies that I'd seen, you know, in the eighties probably. Yeah, you know, and Jared, when you talk, you use the word transform, which you're so famous for doing and really putting yourself into these characters and taking yourself completely out. Um, for Albert, so what was the key for you in, in connecting to that and, and knowing just how to play him? Well, I think, um, the, first of all, the dialogue was great. The story was great. And, 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 and you know, it, it asks more questions and it gives answers, I think, a lot of times for Sparma. So John and I were kind of debating, you know, what he knew, how did he know it? Uh, where did he get the information? And it was just like, I went on my own kind of detective, uh, you know, mission. Uh, and, and it was a bit of a mystery, but that, I think that's what made it so compelling for me. Uh, but the voice was a big one. That was a big kind of clue into um, uh, Albert and the way that he walked, I think was a big one. His physicality um, in general. Uh, and it was interesting to just, you know, I, I think I told John in the beginning, I wanted to try to, you know, push myself to a place that wasn't like recognizably me, like someone may look at him and be like, you know, who, who, who is this guy? Um, and, uh, but to push it to the, that line and obviously not cross it to absurdity, but to see how far we could push it in terms of uh, building a really unique character. Yeah, let me ask you too about uh, in working with the other, your co-stars here, uh, Denzel, just an extraordinary actor. What was that like on set between the two of you? Well, I mean, for me, uh, Denzel is, he's, uh, you know, Beethoven, he's Steve Jobs, he's Brando, all (laughs) kind of rolled up into one. And like John said, a master class. Like I remember the first day I had a scene with him. It's just, you know, it's intimidating, it's exciting. But, you know, as soon as I looked in his eyes, as soon as Sparma had contact with Denzel's character, it was, it was like game on. I saw that twinkle in his eyes. I made one little um, kind of improvatory gesture, if that's even a word. Uh, and, and I saw he, he took it and he ran, he went somewhere totally unexpected. Like he, he smiled and was kind to me. I thought he was going to like be the tough detective and shut down. And I thought, oh sh- shit, this is, this is, it's, it's on, this is going to be a blast. And that really, you know, got me psyched uh, quite a bit. Um, so I was in heaven, both with him and, and Rami you know, just a, a young stud of an actor. And uh, it, it was just, you know, sitting and talking and interacting with these guys um, and just kind of trading jabs was awesome. That scene with Rami is just extraordinary where you're trying to get him into the car, no, suspect number one, everything he thinks about you, you're driving. And uh, that whole play between the two of you is fascinating to watch and you know I I mean I was really screaming watching this going like what are you thinking getting in this car with this guy and he's driving you know (laughs) and playing that it was it it came off great on screen I was wondering what it was like in, in developing that 
Well, John talked about that scene, didn't you? It's quite a bit. It was it was a really important moment because it's kind of nuts that that Rami gets in the car. I mean, you know, but I think that it's kind of a sign that he's, you know, he's not making good decisions anymore. And that I think like Pete, if you saw me in person, you would know how charismatic and, and compelling Albert Sparmo was. <laughs> so maybe that, you know, he, he comes out much better in person, even than, uh, you know, much more seductive. <laughs> Which, um, I, I just looked at it as at that point, he was the obsession had taken hold of him and he had to know. So, you know, he, he could not get in the car. That's, that's it. That was so key to that character and to watch how he right up to the very end of the movie, you know, what, what had happened to him. It was very clear in that, that this, this was a different person. Now this was a person right. truly obsession had taken over. Yeah, Rami has the probably the, the biggest journey in terms of the three characters from where we find him to where we where we meet him to where we find him at the end. Yeah, you know, and Rami Malek would not be the first person I think of in casting that role. He's not a typical kind of uh, uh, actor that you might think for for that kind of straight arrow um, guy. The thing that interested me <laughs> and interested Denzel too, we had a conversation about it, was these two gentlemen, these two cops, are on a quest together. And the harder it is for them to be joined at the hip, the better it is for the movie. And so the fact that you wouldn't necessarily think of, oh, it's Denzel and Rami and they're hanging out. The fact that they look different, act different, come from different backgrounds, everything about that was just interesting. So when the first time we put them in a car together, I thought this is really, really working because they're unlikely bedfellows and, and, and this shared obsession and this, kind of myopic view of, of Sparma and this case. And you can just feel it, the obsession just rising up in them to the point that they, they're gonna do what they have to do. Yeah, which is amazing. So you have Denzel, you have Rami, you have Jared, you have one other major character here, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I'm from LA, I'm a native, you know, and I love it when I don't see the LA that I know so obviously. And, and this is the, um, the back alleys, the backwoods, you know, which when you wrote it was probably there and probably has changed like everything else. So how did you get back to that? Yeah, everything was kind of either exactly or loosely based on, on actual buildings and neighborhoods. And there were street names in the script originally. And here's a bar on the corner of Argyle and Santa Monica or whatever. Um, and like I said, I was kind of living in a crappy apartment in Hollywood at the time. So this was just what I was seeing. And I wanted to make something without LA landmarks. I didn't want to see the Griffith Observatory. I didn't want to see the Chinese theater. I didn't want to see the Hollywood sign because I wasn't looking at those on, on a daily basis. Um, you know, the flop house, I think there's a Whole Foods there now. So I, we ended up <laughs> really embracing that idea of seeing a part of LA that is just as much LA as the Chinese theater, probably more so. And we had to extend um, our search for where to shoot a little bit because places had become gentrified. So we went further east in LA. We went further north in the valley. Um, and, you know, just to kind of show it off and, and just embrace, I think the movie's photographically beautiful but I wanted it to be beautiful in its garishness in a strange way. With the sun too hot, the lime neon kind of garish, um, just those things. I just wanted it to, to look and feel that way. Jared, what's it like? I mean, you know, most actors in movies now, you don't get to actually make movies in LA anymore. Uh, you're, you're, you're going everywhere else. Uh, you're actually shooting here in LA, which is nice. Yeah, here's, here's my pitch. To the, to the governor, Newsom. Let's save, let's get this industry back to California. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, what a gift. I, I, I've, I've only worked as an actor in LA uh, just a handful of times. I think one was Fight Club. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't, it's hard to even remember, which is pretty wild. Uh, but LA is certainly a character. I remember John talking about that in the very beginning, um, uh, talking about how he wanted to, uh, you know, shine a light 
on different sides of Los Angeles. And we certainly did that. And it's always interesting as an actor, you go to places that you typically, you know, don't in a city that you're visiting, but in the city that you know, it was, it was really quite uh, beautiful, um, both for, 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 for the film and for the character to kind of be able to dig, dig in and drive the streets at night and kind of just imagine um, Sparma uh, and his kind of nocturnal life. I always thought of him like, you know, a coyote. Uh, and, uh, you know, he would just kind of, you know, roll through Los Angeles and, and uh, he felt very safe and comfortable in the dark corners and the shadows. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, that, that was really, really a gift to shoot in Los Angeles. Yeah, I'm ready to do it again, John Lee. That sounds good to me. <laughs> Equal? Maybe, to to yeah, the, the the I mean this the the nocturnal life of Albert Sparma. I could see that we could do it straight to you know, yeah. call up uh, you know an HBO Max and we'll just it can be a limited series. What do you think, man? I, I have I have to say, Pete, what um what Jared brought to a role that in my mind was fully formed and a real person, but all the, all the work that he did and that we did, that we did together and discussed and everything, when it showed up physically with him walking onto set and playing Albert and being Albert, it was, it was a phenomenal thing to watch. And he, he's just, I don't know, I, I, he, the, the character always fascinated me, but with Jared playing it, I think about Albert all the time which probably isn't good, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> thinking about him all the time is interesting. But, you know, when you write a script, do you write with actors in mind? Obviously you wrote this in the 90, early 90s. So you, you probably weren't writing with this cast in mind, but did you have people in mind or do you just come up not, with those characters? I try not to. I've had, a, I've had a couple of actors tell me along the way that it feels like you wrote this for me and I'm looking to do something different. And, and I went, well, that's, that's a mistake. And so, and also I think from a writing standpoint, if you have, if for me, if I have somebody I'm locked in on that I think this, is, this person could play this, even if I don't intend to, I could start leaning toward things they've done in other movies or what they do quite well that I appreciate or enjoy. And I would rather have a character that is unique to itself on the page and then, then let somebody like Jared Leto come in and, help bring the character to life. Yeah, so when you saw these characters come to life, you know, going back to when you wrote the script, what did you think? You know, I mean, you know, watching those characters, that vision, was it different in any way or was it the way you had envisioned it? It, it, was, it was odd. This was the oddest movie I've directed in, that I've written in, in terms of, in my head, I didn't even think about it. In my head, I had seen this movie and directed this movie so many times it was always lingering in the back of my brain. So that when, you know, we have the, the first scene with, with Albert and Joe Deacon and, and it turns out great, you're extremely happy and it's slightly different than probably what you had in your head, but that's part of the joy. If you were just, I mean, I know it worked for Hitchcock just to say, here's exactly what it is and hit your mark and say the line and let's move on. But for me, just the exploration of it was, I mean, it was great that it was different. It was, it was great. I mean, you, you come to a different place along the way when you pick the location. You go, this isn't exactly what I had in mind, but I think it's better. Yeah. So, you know, staying open to all that um, proves to be the answer for me. Yeah, Jared, talk about John Lee Hancock as a director. You've worked with a lot of great directors, different directors. What was this one like, this experience? Um, I think I said this to you before, uh, Pete, but John Lee gives you a, a really, a beautiful gift. And I've, I've experienced it a few times. I think maybe the first time was with, um, with uh, Aronofsky and then again with, with Fincher, but he, he gives you that gift that when you walk on set, you know that no matter what, even in your worst failure, that you're going to be okay, that he's going to uh, support you, 
um, and that you can take great risk. And that for me, that's the best um, gift that any director can give you uh, because you know you want to fail six times in a row and on take seven, because you were taking that risk, you reach and find something that, uh, and you go to a place that you haven't been before. Um, so I really appreciated that. I appreciated the breathing room. I appreciated the, the faith uh, in building character and the encouragement and also the decisiveness uh, and his opinion when, you know, because we, especially with Sparma, we were really transforming. There's a walk and a voice and a movement and a way that, you know, uh, they, they were, were contacts, you know, had brown eyes, I had a fake nose, I had prosthetics, I had, you know, we almost had the most amazingly bad wig you've ever seen in your life, which I still <laughs> regret. Wearing. I still, you will see that wig one day. But what was great is like, we were really trying to, like, I, I was fascinated with like, how far to the edge can we go? And John was great because he said, okay, that's, there's the edge. And he, you know, he had a really definitive opinion and that's fantastic. He is a great director. And uh, so, you know, you get spoiled a bit because that's really not the norm. Uh, you know, people out there watching this may think, well, isn't that the director's job? But it's not. I mean, the director's job is really, really hard because not only are you working with your actors and helping their, you know, neurotic, uh, um, you know, our, our neurotic selves, but he's also managing an entire uh, film production. But um, he's incredibly attuned to the detail uh, and very sensitive to his actors. He's an actor's director, you know. Thank you. How does that sound, John? Uh, that's <laughs> I, I'm, I'm blushing. That's uh, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you, Jared. Well, I mean, he already knows I'm a fan. I'm the one that sought him out after the the founder. I was like, I got to meet this guy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that movie and people who haven't seen that movie really under, uh, uh, in my opinion, underappreciated, underwatched movie. It should have been nominated. I thought it's just like one of the great American films. And, uh, you know, I, I, I Keaton, just, his performance just slays and it's just shot perfectly. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous movie. It is a great, it's a great, great movie. It got caught up. I don't know what happened, it, 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 you know, to it. It had distribution problems and things. Uh, and yeah. more people need to seek it out because it really is an astonishingly good movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, I have to ask you, John, you, listening to Jared talk and all about the little nuances and things, that's like the title of your movie here. It's the little things that add up in a performance in a movie like this, it, it's that, and, and you named this movie, and uh, you know, at a certain point, Denzel said, it's the little things. I go, oh, that, that's where they get the title. Sometimes I never know what a title means, but it's the little mm -hmm. things all around that matter here, I think, in making it's, the movie and in, in, in the story here that we're here to. I, I, I think that's true. I have always, when I, when I called the movie that, it was not just one specific little things. It was lots of different complicated little tiny things. And with, with actors, like these guys, it allowed me to really observe behavior, which I love in a movie. I think sometimes little mistakes, if you will, you know, uh, are, are great because they're human or you, the way, the way someone, the way, you know, Jared as, as Sparma might rub his belly or something. It's just, I, I, and I can't even explain why it's additive, but it is for me. It makes them very, very real. So yeah. So it's, it's all those little things, you're right. Was that always the title? I mean, you know, cause you worked it in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You see, you, know, lots of, you see lots of uh, commercials now for Coca-Cola and Chick-fil-A and then they hashtag little things. And I go, oh no, <laughs> it's everywhere. It's <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, I do have to ask you about the ending. I, I only have a minute left here, but um, you know, the, there there is all, all kinds of questions. You're going to have the audience talking here, as I know I was. I'm going like, whoa, look at that, and and that, and and everything goes back, and um, and 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 then you tie it up in in, a, in your own way um, to all come together, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it, like I said, I was hoping for a, you know an unraveling as opposed to coming together with. Uh, 
you know, with a cop and a and someone who might be a killer and all that. Um, and 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 so, I like the fact that it's complicated and unravels. And I think, at least for me, it's far more fulfilling, even though it's 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 playing outside the genre, if you will. Um, and I and I I adore that about it. And and I think that I think the end does really work. Now, you know, we had as soon as we wrapped out there, and I think Jared will remember, there were crew members coming up and asking me questions. Okay, now you can tell me, now you can tell me, now you can tell me. And I said, I don't know. <laughs> really? Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. Jared, what did you think when you, when you read it then? Well, it's an interesting one because you have this like classic American, you know, crime thriller that subverts the genre, you know, completely. Uh, and I like that. I like that it asks more questions for me. You know, the uh, it would be fun to talk about the ending after everyone sees the movie, because I'd be curious, like what a crowd of people would end up saying at like a physical Q and A. Uh, I'd be curious to hear people's opinions and hear the debate. Um, but I like that it's not so neat. I like it's a little messy and it doesn't give you all the answers or it makes you ask more questions. Uh, and, you know, I, I feel really lucky to have been a part of the film. My only complaint is now, I, you know, I don't get to play Sparma ever again, but, you know, maybe when we get the spinoff going, uh, we, can, we can put them in a different, um, we can do the prequel. The, yeah, it's going to have to be the <laughs> and step in those boots again, because uh, it, it, it was really interesting when you you get kind of attached, even if they're, you know, people that you may not agree with. They, you know, everyone has, uh, you know, we've all got different sides to us. And I really, in a strange way, um, have some some affinity with this uh, character now. Um, and, you know, I don't want to give too much of my opinion on what I think uh, it may have happened, but, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a fun and funny guy. Uh, uh, maybe a little square peg in a round hole, but he's, he's a good one, I think. Yeah, well, it's a lot of great um, memorable moments and, and great characters and uh, acting and, and production. It's beautiful right down the line. Cinematography. I, uh, who did the cinematography here? Uh, John Schwartzman I've worked with many times. And Thomas Newman did the score, and you know, they're neither one of those guys are slouches. No, uh, production design, the whole look, everything. Michael Kornblith, Daniel Orlandi, you know, the, the team. You know, <laughs> the team back together. The, well, it's it's uh, really really exceptional. So thanks for joining us today and and talking about all of it, uh, Jared Leto and John Lee Hancock. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much. Thanks. And where's a movie recommendation? Um, <laughs> we all need this in something classic, old school. It doesn't matter. Foreign. Oh, maybe something. OK. Um, well, the, God, there's so many. You know, I just watched a restored version of uh, Two Women, Sophia Loren, great Italian film. Uh, and, and I watched that and she was in her 20s or something doing that. Wow. Extraordinary. Just okay, amazing to see uh, from okay. 61. Okay, there's one for you. Good, good. Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. All right, thanks guys. All right, bye, thank see you Pete, see you, you John Lee, bye. Hey, Jared.